Okay, well, it's great to see everybody here. We all know each other, I see. And uh, this is Computer Science 330. My name is Professor Warford. My office is in RIC 212, <laughs> or 112, whatever. <laughs> And uh, I just handed out this syllabus for you that's available online. Um, as usual, we have a course web page. And it's just like the uh, course web pages of all the ones before. The only thing is, at the end, it's COSC 330. This is computer systems, right? OK, good. And um, I would like to say a little bit about the um, objective of the course. Now, so here's like the story. Um, everything that you've done up until now in your coursework in the major has been mostly programming, right? I mean, the intro, the computer science one, the computer science two, we're learning how to program in C++, data structures, we did C++ some more, object-oriented design, uh, uh, that's what it has been. So we've all, it's really, we've concentrated really at one particular level of computer science, one particular level of abstraction in computer science. Now here's, this is really a fun course, I think, because what we're going to do in this course is we're going to go down, we're going to like, the analogy is driving a car. So you know, you can learn how to drive a car, right? And you don't have to know anything about what goes on under the hood. You don't have to know about the engine, how the engine works, how thermodynamics works, how the water cooling system, all that kind of stuff. That's, cause that's hidden as un under the hood. So what we're going to do in this class is we're going to go under the hood and we're going to find out what goes on all behind the scenes when you write a C++ program and do compile and run. We're going to learn how all that stuff works now under the hood, you know, what goes on behind the scenes to enable you to write a program in a language like C++. That's the big idea. All right? And, <clears throat> and so the title of the course is Computer Systems. And, and uh, now, there's, um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to um, we're going to to investigate a particular uh, computer. See, whenever you go down, whenever you um, go from C++ to a lower level language or to a lower level of abstraction, you have to learn a new language. So what we what we will learn is assembly language. So that's. So now, C++, another language, assembly language. Then, below the assembly language, there's another language called machine language. Okay, that's binary, that's ones and zeros. Right? And, um, and, then we, and so we will learn how computers are organized and how, and then what we'll do is not only will we see how the computer operates at this lower level of abstraction, at the assembly language level, we will also study how the compiler translates from one level to another level. Do you see what I mean? Because actually, you know, when you, when you, when you compile a program, it, it, it translates. It's a translation from C++ to a language at a different level of abstraction. So we have to learn the languages at those abstractions. So we're going to learn two new languages. Actually, we're going to learn three new languages. So to, first, we're gonna, we're, we already know C++. We will learn assembly language, that would be the second one. We will learn machine language, which is ones and zeros, okay? And we will learn how a compiler translates from C++ to assembly language. But then we will also learn how to translate from assembly language to machine language. And not only will we learn how to do that, you will write a program a big program that translates from assembly language to machine language. So this course has a big software project in it. Yeah? What papers are they, right? 
<laughs> no papers, yeah. but a big pro but a big programming project. Now here's the thing. Um, in our curriculum here at Pepperdine, we start everybody off with C++. Most schools don't do that. Most schools start off with Java and then they learn C++ later. We flip this around. So we're also going to take this, this course is also going to be an opportunity for us to learn Java because what you will do is this big project that is a translation project, a big translation program, you're going to write it in Java. It will be so easy. You will be surprised how easy it is to learn how to use Java now that you know C++. It's easier than C++. So we're not even going to, sp we'll spend hardly any, t we'll just spend a few minutes here and there as we need to pick up what we need to do to do, the, to do Java. But at the, in the end, you will use Java. So you're going to need to use, uh, you know, you know how we use NetBeans in the data structures course to write C++? Well, in this course, what we'll do is we'll use NetBeans to write Java. So you've already got NetBeans all set up. And so you're really already all set to go. All right? We have to tell it that we're doing Java instead of C++ somewhere? Yeah. When, once you start writing, and here's, here's another big difference. Here's another big thing, reason I like this course. You know, when we, when we did the data structures uh, stuff, I wrote a lot of the user interface stuff, and you just, I just had you do the data structures part. You're on your own this time. You're going to do the whole thing. All right. So this is this is you know, uh, it's different in that way too. In that you're not just filling in a few things that I now you're going to do the whole thing from the ground up. But don't worry. I mean, I'll, I I said you're on, you're not on your own. But uh, what I'm saying is that you will do the whole thing. You're not you're just I'm just not going to give you a little thing to plug in. You know, you'll do the whole thing. But uh, we'll. It's a really interesting project, and I think it teaches you a lot, not only just about Java as a side benefit, but it teaches you how it teaches the translation process. And, and also, we will have to, <coughs> because, <coughs> because we will be translating from one language to another language, we're also going to be introduced to some language translation theory. So some grammar theory we're going to do, there's going to be a little theoretical component that we'll have to learn too. So this course, it's, um, it's kind of like data structures. It has multiple objectives. You know, one objective is to learn Java, but that's kind of like a side benefit. And, you know, so it's, it's that, it's, it is, the course is designed that way. Okay, so anyway, that's, the, that's what you have to look forward to. Oh, and let me say something about, <clears throat> about the book. <clears throat> so here's show and tell. Here's a book. It's written by, oh, it's written by me. <laughs> so um, here's the good, there's good things and bad things about this, about taking a course from a professor who wrote the book. The, the good thing about taking, about having somebody teach the course who didn't write the book is you get two different perspectives. You get the book's perspective and the professor's perspective. That's a disadvantage in this case because since I wrote the book, I do it the way I like to teach it, and so therefore, the way I teach it is going to very closely follow the book. Because, I mean, if I, had, if I thought there was a better way to do it, I would have written the book differently, right? So anyway, that's a, that's a disadvantage. Um, um, and also, um, the, uh, the other thing I want to say about this book is that since I'm requiring you to, to buy the book and I get a royalty based on every new book sale, I don't get a royalty based on used book sales. But because I get a royalty based on new book sales, if, uh, if you buy the book new, and it's all you have to do is just show me the receipt, and I'll be glad, I will gladly refund to you 15% of the retail price of the book. So that's available for you if you want to use that, uh, take advantage of that offer. And now let me see, what else do we have here? Uh, yes. Digital textbook? Would do you recommend that or? No? Digital textbook. Oh, you can get it so that it's all online now. Oh, you so can. I didn't. E I didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. So how do you? What do you, what do you? Who do you buy it through? The bookstore. The bookstore sells it. Really? Mm -hmm. I can only print out like thirty percent of the pages or something. Do they say which pages you can print out, or do, or how does that work? I think it just 
said you can print 30% of it. Yeah, you know, I don't even know about that. I didn't even know about that. <laughs> you can't buy a new one from the school bookstore. Like oh, you can't have, buy a new one from they the... They only have used books. Right? Really? It's like they stopped ordering the new ones yeah. because people <laughs> sell it back or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because huh. I went and got it today and there's only three. But it was oh, okay. Okay. Well, well, I mean, like if you get it through Amazon or whatever, I'm yeah. sure you could get a new one through Amazon. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're getting royalties from those digital book sales. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't even know. I didn't. I, yeah. I didn't even know about that. There's There's about that. I, need, I need to ask about that. About having you as a professor who wrote the book, if you find an error in the book. Oh yeah. That actually, I think I've. I think we've caught all the errors. But I'll go ahead and make the offer anyway. We're on the fourth edition. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Each edition. Uh, each edition. Every time there's a new edition, uh, there's always new errors that crop into it because there's, there's lots of new material. But, um, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll give you this. Uh, if you find, there is an errata uh, page. So if you go to the, um, if you go to the course web page, one of the links on the course web page is the errata sheet. And the errata sheet are all the errors that, all of the known errors that are in this first printing of the book. And if you find an error, a typographical error of any kind in the book, like a misspelling or a wrong reference to a figure or something, and if it's not already on there, then you get bonus points, homework bonus points. All right. All right. So you can keep a little, e little eagle eye open for, oh, I wonder, and then, but check the e er error sheet, you know, before. Okay. So anyway, yeah. All right. Now, is that all? Final grade, they're going to have two, uh, two exams in the final. Um, I said the rebate, the class schedule, the two, you know, two exams in the final, and then all the rest of the stuff about late homework, course evaluations, attendance policy, blah, blah, blah. That's all the same. I guess we're going to have, um, we're going to do most of our work is going to be programming, although there will be, especially at the beginning, there will be a lot of written assignments at the beginning. But as usual, the homework policy is, if it's a program, you can turn it in at midnight on the day it's due, written, 5 o'clock, my office, you know. So that's usual. Okay, anything else? Any more questions? It's great to have everybody back. <clears throat> All right, well, if there's no more questions, um, let's go ahead and begin. Now, um, I think I'm going to go pretty quickly through this, this, this first material because it's all very elementary and it's stuff you can read. Um, so what we, uh, your first assignment is due Thursday and it is a programming assignment in C++. I don't know if you've looked at that yet or not, but, um, and it's from chapter two, so I think today we'll probably be able to get through chapter one pretty easily, and maybe even part of chapter two. And um, by the way, has, have you guys looked at what the problem is, the programming problem for Thursday? It's, do you remember when you were first learning recursion and you had to write the Towers of Hanoi? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. No. But it's command line version, you know, no GUI, no graphical user interface. Okay, so it's, that's what it is. So I assume that you've seen the Towers of Hanoi. This should be kind of a, a review exercise. But it's an important one to do because guess what we're going to do later in the course? Translate it? We're going to translate it to assembly language. <laughs> so what you'll do is you'll, you will need to refer back to this, to the program that you write, you know, in C++ to see how it gets translated to assembly. So we're going to write, yeah. So that's the purpose. That's just looking ahead a little bit. Okay, so here we go. The title of the book is Computer Systems. Here's chapter one. Now, first thing I need to ask you is this. What is the definition of abstraction? The hiding of detail. Ooh, really good. Hiding detail. Actually, that's one of four, right? Here's the four. Uh, aspects of abstraction and the first one is what you said suppression of detail to show the essence of the matter so it's like you know when we said under the hood you open the hood of the car you close the hood of the car the engine is hidden all those details are hidden you don't even have to know what the engine looks like in order to drive the car right so the, all those details are suppressed so suppression of detail 
Uh, the, a second aspect is an outline structure. What do your English composition people always say to do before you write an essay? An write an outline. What do you always do anyway? You write it first and write the outline. <laughs> well, anyway, you should write the outline first. Uh, the fourth one is division of responsibility through a chain of command. Okay, so um, you guys know what a chain of command is? Yes. Like in what kind of organization? Like yeah, like a hierarchy. Like president, one president, several vice presidents. Each, each vice president has a manager, whatever. Okay. So that's a higher division of responsibility. And another, another aspect is subdivision of a system into smaller subsystems. Okay. Like, you know, like the human body, it has a circulatory system. You know, it has a digestive system. So all those, it's broken, it's subdivided into. All right. So let's take a look at some examples of each one. Um, there's this next figure, uh, figure 1.1, is shows the three different ways to represent abstraction. The first one is called the level diagram. You see it's like uh, the box, you know, one box on top of another box on top of another one. And which one is at the highest level of abstraction, the top box or the bottom box? Probably the top. Yeah, the top is. That's the one that has, that does not show the detail. Okay. And B is, uh, part B of the figure shows a nesting diagram. And um, what, how does this nesting diagram work? Which box, which of those boxes is at the highest level of abstraction? The, an outer box or an inner box? Outer box. Outer box. Okay. And then another uh, way to represent abstraction is with a hierarchy or tree, tree diagram. And that looks like what kind of a chart? You guys, if you guys had to do anything in business. What's that called? No. No business people here? Have you not ever heard of an organization chart? Oh, sure. Really? Yeah. Well, whenever you go to work for a company, the first company you go to work for, one of the first things that you'll want to see is the org chart. Because who does it, what does the organization chart tell you? Who's boss. the boss? <laughs> right? Who's, in, who's the boss? You know, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the boss, the, you know, who you report to, whom you report to. Yeah, are we good? So here's some examples. Here, I think this is the most, one of the most striking examples of abstraction. When I first found this, this series of, um, of bas relief, uh, you, guys know, you guys know who Henry Henri Matisse is? You never heard of Matisse? Oh, here, you're going to get some culture here. Not only computer science, we're going to get some culture. Um, okay, Matisse, he was um, an artist he, in the early 1900s. And these things are massive. They're a, uh, they don't have the originals, but they have exact duplicate copies of these at the UCLA Sculpture Garden. That's where I got these, this series of figures. But these things are about like from here to the ceiling. They're really huge. They're, they're, it's like brass. Okay, and look at this is fascinating. He has the, a picture of a woman that he... Uh, he, he did this sculpture in uh, 1909 and you can see all the detail you know you can see the you know the the muscles in her arms and her legs and you can see all in more detail and then look in 1913 it's what's happening what's happening to the figure between 1909 and 1913 less detail, less detail. and then what happens in 1917 even less detail further and then finally in 1930 Boom, just the essence of the shape. You know, he was an artist dealing with shape, you know. And it just shows, just graphically, from one to the next, how the, de how the um, detail was suppressed, leaving only the essence of the matter. Oops. And he has a, there's, actually, I should read this. Um, there's a great, he, he, uh, he was, uh, Matisse was one of the artists, a lot of, some artists are not very um, verbal, but Matisse was able to enunciate. Listen to this. Here's what he wrote. He wrote this in 1908. And check this out. In a picture, every part will be visible and will play the role conferred upon it, be it principal or secondary. All that is not useful in the picture is detrimental. A work of art must be harmonious in its entirety, 
for superfluous details would, in the mind of the beholder, encroach upon the essential elements. So he's talking about, see, all these details, that encroaches upon this element. So therefore, suppress them. And there, and there, and that, why is this art, what, what, what kind of art is that, is that called? Abstract art. Yeah? Huh? Why is it called abstract art? Because those details are not, that are not essential are done away with, and it's just the essence. You know, getting truth. You know, every, every discipline has its own truth. You know, and can, there's a certain way to get truth in computer science, right? With propositional calculus, and predicate, <laughs> right? True, false, right? But in art, there's a, there's a d d different way to get truth. And so that's, that's their, you know, truth and beauty, you know. And here in figure 1.3, this is a, um, this is a, um, what kind of diagram is this? Level. Level diagram. And notice that it's the back four is at the top level of abstraction. That was, yeah, see, that's this one. That, that's the one that's the most abstract. Are you with me? See, so there's a level diagram for that example of, and here's another favorite of mine. Do you guys have a copy of the U.S. Constitution that you read before you go to bed at night? <laughs> I have one right here in case you want one. I have extras. <laughs> and do you know how many articles there are in the Constitution? Seven. Seven. <laughs> That's pretty good. How do you wow. know that? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and how many sections? How many sections are in the first article? Ten. Ten. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Are you with me? And there it is. And now, do you see that this that the Constitution is divided into articles, and the articles are divided into sections? And what kind of a diagram is this? This is a nesting diagram of the Constitution. Does everybody see that? So the outer box is the whole Constitution, the top bigger box is Article 1, and then the 10 smaller boxes are each section of the Constitution, right? And here's another example. Here's, our, here's an example of an org chart, okay? President, you got, President has four vice presidents. The vice president of the college division has the director of marketing, the mar manufacturer, manager of manufacturing, and each one of these has more. I just showed, you know, one expansion for each one, and then director of marketing, blah, 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 right? So this is who reports to whom. F and why is this important? Do you guys do this in software? Do you, do you see, this is a direct, con there's, a direct, there's a direct application of this to software design. What would it be? Instead of having these be, instead of having the president have four vice presidents, what would have what? Like classes? Mm. Um. Yeah, oh, actually there is a class higher. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, actually you're right. The, no, no, a, a UML diagrams are an example of a hierarchy. You're right, that is an example. A UML diagram is a hierarchy like this. I'm thinking more in terms of, of uh, flow of control. What does the what does the what do you suppose the president of the corporation spends his time doing? Delegation. Yeah, meeting with the vice presidents. Mm -hmm. so you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And we'll coordinate it all so that everything all fits together, right? And then what does each one of those vice presidents do? They turn around and do what? Oh well, we have to do this. So uh, the way to do that is to you do this, you do this. So uh, what does that correspond to in a program? Probably like functions. Yeah. And who, who is, program. yes, the president is the main program. And you're delegating things to happen. Yeah? So this could be like a call, this could be like, like a call tree, like a who calls whom, you know? Right? Only thing that gets it mixed up here, the, the, the analogy breaks down is with recursion, because with recursion, you could call him, and then this person could call him, and then they get, you know, mutually recurses, so it doesn't quite work, but anyway. All right, is everybody clear? And what kind of diagram is that? Hierarchy. Hierarchy diagram. And here is a level diagram that also shows a chain of command, right? Four-star general, three-star general, two-star general, one-star general, colonel, lieutenant colonel, blah, blah, blah. Right, so you can organize a military organization that way. And here we finally get to, after all those examples, we get to the one that we need to know. Now, <clears throat> As you know, in every course that you take, there are some things that you just have to commit to memory. 
<laughs> and I see our cameraman over there shaking his head saying, you better know this. <laughs> so I insist that you commit this to memory. Oh dear. These are the seven levels of abstraction of a computer system. And let's take them from the top. Oh, and so you need to know the, the number and the name. So the number seven at the top, that's the application level. An example of that would be like say Microsoft Word, okay? A person who's using Microsoft Word doesn't need to know how to program. Just needs to know how to, you know, step on the accelerator, turn the steering wheel. Just need to know what to click, boom, and how to type, right? Are you with me? So seven is the application level. Now, the le level below that is level six. That's called the high order language level. Okay. Now, what programming language did you use at the high order language level? C++. C++. Okay. The one below that is level five. That's the assembly level. That's the assembly level. Okay. And now I can't, I can't give you examples of this yet because we haven't learned assembly language yet, but we we will. The level below that is the operating system level. We have a whole course here on operating systems. Okay, and <clears throat> the operating system provides a services to the levels that are above it. So the operating system provides a service, could provide one of the, op one of the services that the operating system provides is the file service, how, how to say, store data in files, right? That's the main thing that it does. It also provides a service of running programs for you. Okay, so it does both file, it does data and execution. It does both sides. Okay, and then at the at level three, the below the operating system level is level three. That's the that's called the instruction set architecture level. Instruction set architecture. That is machine language. Okay. Now, what we're going to do in this course is, in this course, we are going to learn, we already know seven and six. What we're going to concentrate on learning in this course is levels five, four, and three. Now, are any of you, Kyle, are you in the next organization? organization? What we're going to do in computer organization is we're going to do two and one. Mm -hmm. So that's how that works. So. At this point, is all you have to do is just memorize level two is the microcode level, level one is the logic gate level. And, but we won't deal with that at all in this course. But when you take the computer organization course, that's what you'll do. Do those two lower levels. So you see why it's important to, to know, it's really important to know how this all gets, is subdivided and how all the interconnections work between each other. Because all computer systems are organized this way. I mean, from your iPhone to your, you know, Is to your big mainframe. Hmm? Is this the best way? To do well, it's the only. It's basically the only way to do it. I mean, it's the way. Well, I don't. I shouldn't say it's the only way to do it, but it's, it's the way that it's all done. It's the way every computer system. Every computer system is built. This is based on this hierarchy. Is based on the on these levels of abstraction. And I tell you, here's another thing I'll tell you, and that it is that early in the early in the development of computers. You know, like in the late 40s, the early 50s, late 50s, and, and the, there was a tendency to not, to not have the a strict separation of levels of abstraction, and it came. There was a huge breakthrough. The IBM 360, uh, IBM. There was a huge breakthrough in rec in actually designing computers along these lines of levels of abstraction and having a clearly demarked layer in between. That was a big design breakthrough, uh, that, a realization that, and, and you know, really it was inevitable that it would happen because, I mean, every complex machine is built this way anyway. You know, the analogy with the car, you know, there's a cooling system and then da, 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 and, and, you know, each one is, is, um, is engineered, you know, like the electronic part system in an automobile, it's engineered with a certain interface, 
and you know in, in between the levels of abstraction and so and every system it has a well-defined um, function that it carries out and it's not it's not one big monolithic thing see so anyway it's a really really important idea and, and by the way I should say I should probably if you if, if you read the um, acknowledgments I there's one author who really influenced me a long long time ago before, you know and inspired me to write the book <clears throat> His name is Tannenbaum, and he wrote a computer. He hit his his book is still is still uh, widely used. It's still in print, uh, and it's used a lot. But uh, his name is his, his name is Tannenbaum, and his, his was the first textbook to really uh, present computer systems very clearly this way. It was a very influential. Uh, so I should give him some credit for that. So here's a picture uh, that lists some. Hi. Oh, now, remember what did we say level 6 was? High order language. High order language. So we're going to abbreviate that HOL6. All right. So HOL is high order language. So here are some high order HOL6 languages. Fortran, BASIC, C++, Lisp. Lisp, we call it Scheme now. Scheme is a version of Lisp. I guess now it's Racket, remember those of you who are. And Java, okay. So there's some, there's some examples. Um, Fortran is probably the oldest in this list. And BASIC was important a long time ago before it was superseded by these other ones. Pascal Yeah, Pascal is another one. Ada is another one. Uh, what's another one from Paradigm's class? Prologue. Prologue. That'd be another one. All right, now. Here's, this figure 1.8 is really an interesting figure because it applies to so much. It's so simple, but it applies to so much. What does a computer basically do? It takes what? Input. It takes input, and then what does it do? Process. It processes it, and then what does it produce? Output. output. That's what all computers do. That's what all programs do. Right? That's what they do. That's how they operate. Input, processing, output. IPO. Right? And we're going to see how this works. Whenever we see how a computer is organized, you know, we'll want to keep this, this in mind. Now, I said there was one picture that you needed to memorize. Here's another one. This figure 1.9 from the book is um, a block diagram of the four components of a computer. So we need to go over each one of these and understand what each one does. How, what each one, examples of each one. Okay, first of all, <coughs> the four parts of the, uh, before we talk about each individual part, how, what, how are they connected? What connects them? Physically, uh, from the figure. If I, if you look at it, if I if I tell you there's four parts to the computer, the bus. The bus connects them. Oh, okay. Right? You see that from the figure. The four you know, the four parts are the four boxes on the top. And then the thing that connects them all is the bus. Now, okay. Now here is the definition of a bus. That's. Check this out, you guys, over here. <coughs> Very simple. It's not a yellow vehicle with <laughs> school children in it. <laughs> a bus is nothing more and nothing less than a group of wires. That's basically all it is. Now, that's way simplified, <laughs> but at its essence, physically, these are wires. Now, of course, on a printed circuit board, we, instead of having, the wires aren't like, what's an example of a wire? Like this wire right here, you know? It, they're not actually wires that are floating around separately like this. On a printed circuit board, what do the wires look like? Yeah, a little copper, it's a little copper deposited, you know, there's a deposit of copper, little, 
have you seen circuit boards, you know, with the copper lines? Yeah. And then, and furthermore, inside of a chip, the wires can actually be laid down inside of a chip, you know, very microscopic. If you looked under a microscope, you could see. But it would be deposited on that chip. It would be like, it would be just like, you can just think of it as being wires. It's just a connect, it's just, it's just makes an electrical connection from one component to another component. Does everybody see that? So when you think of this bus, you can just, what you should visualize is just a bunch of wires going back and forth. Right? So that's all, there's no, physically on the, on the bus itself, on those wires itself, there's no electronics there, it's just a group of wires. The electronics are at either end of the wires, okay? And that, that's called the bus controller, the, the components at the, at the ends of the wires. Are you with me? So those are just, those are just wires. So now, what, so now what are the four parts of the computer? The first part is you've got input devices. Now, which way do you see? Which way does that arrow flow from that box? Into the bus. Yeah, in, from the input device into the bus. So the input device, the signal goes from the the data is flow. The, those arrows are data flow arrows. Are you with me? So the data is going from the input device onto the bus, and then what's the next one? The central processing unit. So what's the acronym for the central processing unit? CPU. CPU. All right. And which way does data flow with the CPU? Both. Back and forth. Yeah, back and forth. And what about main memory? Same. Back and forth. And then what about the output device? Just out. Just out to the output. So does everybody see? So those are data flow. Is everybody with me? And how does that data flow? If you want to send something from the input device to main memory, where does it go? From the input device onto the what? From the input device onto the what? Bus. Onto the bus. The signal travels along the wire and then up into main memory. Are you with me on that? That's physically the way the signal travels. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's the way. Now, you know, I'll say this is the way 95% of commercial computers are organized. Of course, there are variations, you know, but. This, this basic, and there's lots of simplification here, but that's basically it. Okay, now, do you guys know your prefixes? Mostly. Well, here's another one you need to memorize. Always. Yep. Now, you don't need to memorize, I take that back. I could get the right column. <laughs> well, I mean, here, let's take a look at the, let's take a look at the pico, nano, micro, milli, kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta. Those are the decimal multiples, right? So how, how, long, how many meters is a kilometer? A thousand. a thousand, right? How many grams is a kilogram? A thousand. A thousand. How many grams is a milligram? Mm. One thousand. One one thousandth, yeah. right. Okay, are you with me? So how many, how many seconds is a nanosecond? One one billionth. A uh, one one millionth of a second would be a what? Would be a microsecond. Is everybody clear on that? Mm -hmm. And how much? How many bytes is in a one terabyte disk? A billion? Oh no. A trillion. A trillion. Would it be a trillion? Let me see. A kilo is a thousand. A mega is a million. A giga is a billion. A tera is a trillion. Oh, that's convenient. TT. Terra is a trillion. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, you get terra. I mean, terabytes. Were unheard of. They were. And now you can, now you can just buy them. them. Yeah. You just bought a terabyte drive. Yes. I mean, if you had told me that yeah. ten years ago, I would almost not have believed it, even though I could have predicted it. Sell three terabyte ones. Yeah. That's so dumb. So no, I mean for video. Yeah, I mean you will always need more. Music. You will always need more. Crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. You guys, I can't. I, I envy you <laughs> because you guys are going to live. By the time you get, you get to be my age, I mean, man, no telling. Might be a petabyte. Who knows? For sale. Who knows? And then PETA, yeah, I, and by the way, I've had to increase these tables <laughs> from the first edition to the, this is the fourth edition. I've had to increase these. It used to be, I used to not bother with t t even Terra, 
in the early, you know. But I'm like, geez, I gotta have to. Uh. And now, here's the other thing. In computer science, everything is binary, right? Information is always stored in binary. So the computer science value of a kilo is not 10 to the 3. Instead, it's 2 to the 10. Now, if you work out 2 to the 10, it's like, here's how it goes. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 5, 12, 1,024. So that's 10. All right? So 2 to the 10 is 1,024. Well, how much is a mega? A mega is 1,024 times 1,024. In other words, it's 2 to the 10 times 2 to the 10, which is 2 to the 20. So when you're talking about a megabyte of memory, of main memory, you're not really talking about 10 to the 6 bytes. You're talking about 2 to the 20. But now look, how close is it? Relative. 2 to the 20. I mean, two to 10 to the 6 is one zero 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 to the twenty is one zero four eight five seven six. See, so it's very close. You don't have to memorize these not, these digits, obviously. I'm not, when I said memorize this, you don't you don't have to you don't have to know that it's one zero four eight five seven six. You just want two to the just two to the twenty. Yeah. Are you with me? So, uh, but it's so close that and you know some people some companies get you know, into trouble for marketing because they'll use. Sometimes you'll, they'll, they will use the decimal, but then sometimes they'll use this, you know. And it's, it's, for main memory, you, it's always powers of two, but for disks, it's ambiguous. You know what I mean? Do you think, what was your, what were you going to ask? I was going to ask if Apple iPods use the, um, the powers of 10 for, for their gigabytes. Because I've gotten a 16 gig that was really 14.6 or something. Yeah, well, you know, some of that, some of that might not be because of this. Some of that might be, some of that might be because, um, yeah, yes, operating, yeah, yeah. And notice that the, by the way, notice that the um, approximation gets worse the higher you go. So, two to the 10, you're only off by, what's well, tw 24 out of 1,000. That's, that's 0.2%. By 2 to the 30, you're off like 5%. Like 5 but here, by the time you get to 2 to the 30, you're off by 7%, and then you're off by 9%, and then you're off by 12%. But anyway, that's how that works. So here are some examples of input devices, keyboards, disk drives, magnetic tape drives, mouse devices, barcode readers. You know, when you press a keyboard, when I, when I press a, a key on this keyboard, boom, then my, you know, the, that sends a signal from that key, so that goes to the electronics of the keyboard, and that signal goes along a wire into main memory. All right. Okay, and then here's, and here's the, this figure 1.11 shows how when you, an input device, um, the data goes from in, across the box, I mean across the bus, sorry, up to mem, to memory. Okay. And all data is stored in binary. So, city, anybody know what a bit means? Didn't we do this before? Mm -hmm. No, no a, a character is, is eight bits. A bit is one. Yeah. One. A bit stands for, binary yeah, binary digit. All right, so that's a bit. And a bit can either be Binary, it can either be one or zero. Inside the computer, it's a voltage level. High voltage level is one, a low voltage level is zero. Okay? So here's an example of how the character K would be stored. Here is a bar, here's another way to store binary data, uh, digital data. A barcode, you know, the barcode on the product. U UPC, this is the uniform product code. Uniform, uniform product code, I think is what it stands for, UPC. Anyway, here's what's interesting. It's, the, you know, it's, the, it's bars, and um, you see uh, the bars on the left, it's divided in half. Because, you know, when you scan it with a barcode reader, you don't know if the package is going to be this way or this way. Better read either way. So it has to be able to read either way. So what they do is, the code for storing the number 
differs depending on if it's on the left side or the right side of the barcode so that it can be read both ways. Do you see what I'm saying? And here's the actual code. You could actually, if you, if you take this code and you look at a barcode, you could, you could actually read from the thing. So look at here. So you see the seven? It's, what is it? It's dark, light, 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 dark, light, light. So it's one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero. So here's seven. One zero zero one zero one zero one zero 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 one zero zero. So this is on the right hand side. That seven is on the right hand. That's how you store a seven on the right hand side of the bar of, of the barcode. Yeah. And here's some output devices: disc, magnetic tape, screens, printers. Okay. Here's how the data flows in an output device. Is everybody good? We good on this? Okay. Here's pixels. I used to have to explain all this pixel stuff. People know pixels now, right? Higher. D, what's, what's, uh, what's a typical, what's your typical printer resolution in pixels? 1080, 720. Well, on a printer, well, on a screen. Yeah, those are screens. Yeah, 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 those are screens. I was thinking a printer. It's what by what per inch? Six cent, I, I think. Uh, I think a, a high I think a high quality printer is 600 dots per inch, isn't it? DPI, that's right. Yeah, dots per inch. Yeah, or I think 1200 is commercial. I think 1200 is fast draft. It's like 200 or 300. Yeah, yeah, fast draft is it's more less resolution, but yeah. little jag. You see the little jaggies. Less ink. Yeah, less right, time. right. Okay, so now here in Figure 1.18 is t is what typically happens. What does now what does a program do? What do all programs do? Input, input process. processing, and output. So look how it works. Look how that relates to this, and then we'll quit. Okay, so first of all, data flows in. So it goes in from the input device into memory. Then to do the processing, which component does the processing? processing. The central processing unit. <laughs> all right, so, so it goes from memory to the CPU. That's where it's processed. Then it goes from the CPU back to memory. And then the results go from the memory to the output device. So does everybody see how that sequence works? What happens in memory before it needs to go out to output? <clears throat> it just saves. Memory, the only thing memory does is it stores the ones and zeros. That's it. It does That's no process. That's what RAM that, that is RAM. Yes, that is RAM. That is RAM. Are we good? Hmm? Random access yeah. Okay, so we'll, it's time to quit. So we didn't quite get, we, we're almost through. We'll just, a few more minutes to um, finish up chapter one, so we'll do chapter two tomorrow. Then you'll have a homework assignment for Thursday. All right, good deal. See you next time.